Well, we're going to dive right in. We've got a lot to cover this morning. And even though we have a lot to cover, we're only going to do half of chapter 4 of Genesis. And so we're going to start out in Genesis 1, go to verse 16. The title of the message is called Worship and Murder. Everybody leaned in like, wow, okay. This is going to be fun. This is going to be good. Well, we finished up chapter 3 last time. And uh, we saw that this answer, the answer to the question, why is everything so broken? Why is everything the way that it is? It's so jacked up, right? Why are relationships so difficult? And why is work so hard? Uh, we saw that in chapter 3. We saw how Adam and Eve, they encountered the serpent, and we saw them make the wrong choice. We saw how God came and confronted them, and we saw how Adam and Eve ex- were expelled from the garden, But we saw that Adam spoke Eve's name as a prophecy of hope. Because even after God told them what the consequences for their sin would be, we see that what stuck in Adam's mind was God's promise that through the woman would come the seed, the human who would crush the head of the serpent and reverse the curse, who would defeat death itself. So if you think about all of the ancients, right, all of, you know, the the patriarchs of the faith, the, the prophets all throughout the Old Testament, this is what they were looking for. This is what they were talking about would come. The idea of the seed coming from the woman. This promise is what they would have held on to. But then put yourself in the place of Adam and Eve in chapter four, who again just heard the prophecy that this would happen, that it would come from them. It would be from their lineage. Do you think they were thinking, hey, you know, that's a great promise, but it's going to be thousands of years before we see that come into fruition? I don't think so. I think today in chapter 4, we're going to see that they thought that it was going to be much more of an immediate thing, that it would happen in their lifetime. We see that they start a family, And then we also see that this happens after they're already expelled from the garden, the sanctuary of delight. What we saw in Genesis 3 was that man sinned against God. But what we see in Genesis chapter 4 is not only will man sin against God, man will sin also against man. And it's a tough story, but it's one that will teach us a lot about ourselves and the nature and progression of sin even in our own lives. So Genesis 4, starting in verse 1, says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Now the very first interesting thing is right away, in verse 1, we see that Eve bears a son... And right away, she says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen Will Ferrell in the skit from Saturday Night Live where you see this woman who's giving birth, and then all of a sudden, this grown man comes out, and it's Will Ferrell, and he's like, man, it was hot in there. Anybody see that? No? Okay, good. Don't watch that. That's not good. Um, when When she says, I have begotten a man, it's not like that... Cain was born as a man, like Will Ferrell. No, no, but what she's saying is this is the one. With the help of God, I have begotten the man, the one that was prophesied about. She's thinking, listen, being expelled from the garden is short because here's my firstborn and he's the chosen one. And then it says she gives birth to Abel. 
Nabal's name means breath. And we see their professions. Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. And what we can see from their professions was that God, what God had commanded them to do, they were doing. When he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it, we see both Cain and Abel doing that. So even though the fall has happened and original sin has tainted everything and everyone, the cultural mandate is still going forward. And even though the law for sacrifice, the ceremonial law, has not been given yet, we do see that they have some form of knowledge that there should be sacrifice and that there's a a way in which it should be done. We see that Abel brings exactly what we would expect him to bring. He brings the firstborn of his flock. He's a shepherd. And it says that the Lord accepts his offering. And then we see Cain bring what we would expect him to bring as a farmer, as someone who would work the ground just like his dad. He brought the fruit that he harvested. But it says that God rejects Cain's sacrifice. So why do you think that God would accept Abel's and reject Cain's? I mean, some people have the thought, well, you know what? What Abel brought was a blood sacrifice, and so that maybe is what it is. But we also see later on when the ceremonial law is given that actually that there were grain and fruit offering was also acceptable. There was a place for that as well. So that's probably not what is in view here. What is it then that makes a sacrifice acceptable to the Lord? It doesn't just say that the Lord was displeased with Cain. Here's a hint. It doesn't just say that he was displeased with Cain's offering. If you look at verse 5, it says that he was displeased with Cain and his offering. So actually, it has something to do more connected with Cain than it is to what was actually brought. God always only wants an offering that comes from a pure motive. The offering that is given in faith with a pure heart, is the one that he desires. And so point number one for this morning is acceptable worship is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. It's always and forever been about the heart. See, just going through the motions, doing what we're supposed to do, but with hearts far from the Lord, is exactly what Jesus meant when he called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside, but inside it's just death and decay. It seems entirely likely and probable that the reason why God rejects Cain's sacrifice and accepts Abel's is because Abel offered out of a heart of love towards God. And a clue here is that it says that Abel brings the firstborn of his flock. It doesn't say that Cain brought the first fruits for his offering. So it is possible that what we are seeing is that Cain was holding back the best and the first for himself. But regardless, what we can say without a doubt is that God would only reject an offering that was offered out of an impure motive. We haven't even gotten to the murder part yet, but we see that Cain has already committed an offense against God. Because notice what he has done. He has made an outward show of righteousness with an inward resistance. You know what we call that? We call that legalism. When you're just doing the outside, you're just focusing on the outside, but totally ignoring the heart. He's going through the emotion or the motions for his own gain, for outward appearance. Cain believes he can simply do what is right according to the letter of the law, but his heart doesn't have to be in the right place. So he exercises from a position that external righteousness is all that is required of me. I don't have to love this. I don't have to love the Lord. I just have to do these things. True worship is a matter of the heart. As 1 Peter says, not of the outward life, but of the hidden person of the heart, which is what God sees when he looks at us. Throughout all of Scripture, is this idea that the Lord desires mercy, not sacrifice. 
Psalm 51, 16 and 17 says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus also said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does my will does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I mean, that should make every believer stop and take assessment of our hearts. Those people were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were prophesying. They were, they were casting out demons. I mean, these are things that are, like, we look at and they're like, whoa, like, they have to be close with the Lord if they're doing those. They were doing those things, but their hearts were far from him. And so Jesus says, I, depart from me. I, I never knew you. Jesus longs for us to move beyond the idea of sacrifice, what we feel obligated to give up to be perceived as religious. He wants our hearts involved. So think about it. What do we see happening in the very next chapter after the first sin? Well, Adam and Eve sin is sort of like this bumbling thing, right? Like they almost can't even do it well. And it's like they stumble into it. It's still a choice for sure. But what we are starting to see now, just a chapter later, is a more sophisticated form of sin that's taking place. And also, when murder is done, sin is getting more bold. So in one generation, we see sin taking on nuance. We see sin progressing. And really what Cain is doing when he offers a sacrifice that is really an only outward appearance type of thing is he's just putting on maybe slightly better fig leaves to cover his shame. It's a false covering. It's what God's word would call filthy rags trying to be portrayed as righteous. A good friend shared this quote with me this week. It's from Thomas Kempis from the book of The Imitation of Christ. It says, but they who love Jesus for the sake of Jesus and not for some special comfort of their own, not for what Jesus can give you, but to love him because of him. He says, they bless him in all tribulation and anguish of heart. Even in the most difficult times, they will still. People who love Jesus for Jesus and not for what he can just give you, they will still bless him and love him in the toughest times of life. And it says, as well as in the highest comfort, even in the good that he brings. Although Jesus should never give them comfort, they would praise him notwithstanding and wish to always give thanks. Oh, how powerful is the pure love of Jesus, which is mixed with no self-interest or self-love. Whatever it is that Cain brought before the Lord, we know that it was not a broken and contrite heart, because the Lord would never reject that. What we see in Abel is an awareness of brokenness and sin that Cain does not demonstrate, which we'll see as we continue in the story that's not going to change. Look at Cain's response to God when he rejects Cain's sacrifice. Basically, what God is doing is calling him out. And look what, look what Cain does in verse five, 5. It says, So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. His response to being called to account is anger, and he rebels even further. And then it goes on to say, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will, not, will you not be accepted? And if you, do not, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you 
must rule over it. Here we see God doing what he always does, right? There's, there's sin. He, he goes to Cain just like he went to Adam and Eve and asks them. He invites them into a conversation. That's God's mercy. God could have simply, because he knows his heart, he could have simply just dead right there. He would have been justified in doing that. But instead, he asks questions. He knows he's all-knowing, but he asks. Why does he ask? Because he wants Cain to look introspectively. Cain, why is your reaction this? There's something going on in your heart. Why are you angry? Cain, you know what is required of you, but you've chosen to do otherwise. God is patient, and he means for us to learn from our failures. He's not the God who is waiting to smack you upside the head as soon as you fail or you do something wrong. That's not who he is. We think of him that way sometimes. But he's long-suffering. He's patient. He wants to lead you to repentance, a turning away of sin. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. I love this. Literally, God giving Cain an opportunity to repent to slay his anger, but instead, you know what he does? In his anger, he turns and he slays his brother. His brother's righteousness incurs Cain's wrath. He sees that his brother is accepted and it makes him angry to the point that he is willing to kill him. Point number two is this, put jealousy to death. Why is Cain angry? What, like when, he, when God's asking, why are you angry? Cain is jealous. I mean, maybe, maybe it was one of those things where he's been told all his life from the very beginning, hey, you are the begotten one. You're the chosen one, Cain. And so then as soon as his offering is rejected, he's like, wait a second. I I thought, I'm the one, right? Why, Why is my brother accepted and I'm not? And all of a sudden, jealousy begins to grow. God says, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Sin here. If you think of it this way, sin is actually portrayed as a wild animal. It's like like the alpha predator. It's crouching at your door, wanting to devour you. So a couple years ago, how many of you remember a show called Tiger King? Okay, by the laughter, I assume you know. I'm not recommending it, but it's this, you know, like, crime, drama, documentary kind of thing, which is really looking at the interconnectedness of people who um, have their own private zoos, and especially breeding large cats, right? Like tigers and lions and pants, all those things. Mostly tigers. I mean, this, this show became so popular that for that year that it was released, for Halloween, the number one costume was of Joe Exotic. He's one of the main characters, right? Like people were going dressed like Joe Exotic. Well, before Joe Exotic, there was actually a a Tiger King of Harlem. Think of this, a Tiger King in the middle of Harlem. In 2003, there was a man by the name of Antoine Yates who shows up at the local hospital with a mangled arm just like ripped to shreds. And when the the medical staff asked what happened, he said, well, my pit bull bit my arm. And the medical staff, they're like, man, that is, that doesn't quite match. Pit bulls can be pretty, you know, their bites are pretty strong, but this doesn't quite match a pit bull bite. 
So they actually sent cops to go investigate his apartment. And when they go and investigate, they, they cut a hole in the door to look to see what's going on, what's inside. And when they look inside, there's a tiger, a full-grown Bengal tiger that pounces at them. So, of course, they call animal control, and they take care of it. And when the neighbors were asked, like, did you not know this was going on? They were like, well, we just thought that the guy really liked chicken because he bought so much chicken. More than anybody that we've ever seen, he loved chicken. Well, he wasn't eating the chicken just himself. He was feeding it to his full-grown Bengal tiger in his apartment. Now, we might think, Antoine, what in the world were you thinking? What do you think would happen? Like, how stupid could you be? But he didn't get it as a full-grown tiger. He actually got it as a tiny, cute, little tiger cub. And he kept feeding it chicken, and it kept growing. And it was, it was just a little pet. Like, it, oh, it's so cute. Like, how cool is it that I have this tiger cub? And he kept feeding it chicken, and it kept growing and growing and growing, and he kept it hidden, didn't tell anybody about it, and it kept growing and growing until it turned and did exactly what it was meant to do. He learned that this thing was actually crouching and waiting. Did you know that there was a study done that even like little, little cats, house cats, that if they were big enough, they would eat their owners? Like if they're looking at you and it's kind of like you get that creepy feeling, yes, they want to eat you. That's why I would never recommend getting a cat. But this, this the tiger literally got to the point where it could do it, and so it pounced. Literally started to devour his owner. I think there's something we can learn in this. See, that often is the exact picture of sin in our lives. We are like Cain, we tell ourselves, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. I, I can have this problem with the way I talk about people. I can have this problem about how negative I am. I can have this problem where I'm judgmental or I do things out of selfish ambition. I can have this problem where I compare myself to others and get jealous or self-righteous. I can have this problem where I look at things I know I shouldn't look at. I can spend my money this way or spend my time that way. Sure, I get it. It's sin, but really it's just a small sin. You know, it just it's a little vice and it's not really doing that much harm. It's, it's not like going out and murdering someone, right? Maybe, you know, I have this anger for this person that I've had for the last 20 years, but it's no big deal. I've got it under control. But sin always grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And listen, it's not a pet on a leash. It is a predator. And sooner or later, it will consume you. This is what God is warning Cain about. So when God pricks your conscience, when he convicts you, he's inviting you into a dialogue and he says, hey, 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 what are you doing? then I would encourage you to be quick to own it, repent, turn away from it, take God's out that he's giving you. We should not be quick to anger, but to repent and acknowledge, I've got a Bengal tiger and I need your help, Lord. As John Owen famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And so I would ask, what sin in your life are you keeping around? What are you continuing to entertain? Or that you're in denial of the power that it has over you? You're just petting a tiger, ignoring that it can and will 
turn on you and devour you. Cain's anger was fueled by jealousy, but ultimately there's something even deeper. There's something even deeper that was causing his jealousy. And I think as we continue to read, we're going to unearth what that actually is. So we're going to read Genesis, the rest of it, 4, 8 through 16. It says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Point number three is put self-focus to death. Put self-focus to death. Cain does the unspeakable thing. He murders his own brother. Does God immediately strike him down? No, again, he goes to him and he opens up dialogue. He asks him. He gives him the opportunity to repent again. He knows what has happened. But did you notice how Cain actually responds? He responds with blame shifting and evasiveness in anger, and even sarcasm. Like he, he even has sarcasm with the Lord God. He's like, well, am I my brother's keeper? Why are you coming to me looking for my brother? Am, am I my brother's keeper? He's sarcastic. It shows just how hard-hearted, how cold his heart has become. Even though God is patient and he initi- initiates dialogue with him, and warning, and questioning, and giving opportunity for repentance, what we see then, God does a further act of faithfulness by actually placing some discipline, some consequences, punishment for sin in his life, right? He says, well, from now on, you've you've experienced some level of fruitfulness from your labors. From now on, you will not have any success in gardening, in farming. It's done, You're not going to experience any of the common graces of farming. And then he says he's going to be a wanderer. Now, if you know anything about gardening or farming, how how effective can you be at farming if you have to wander around from place to place? Right? It takes seasons in order to be able to plant and then yield the fruit of your labor. He will not be able to do that. He has to wonder. The the consequence is really giving up his livelihood, being fruitful in what he's done. He's doomed to a life of wondering. God is just, and he knows how to make a punishment that fits the, the crime. And then we see how Cain responds in verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And what if Cain would have said, listen, my punishment, it doesn't even, it's not even harsh enough, because I I killed my own brother, Lord. But we don't see Cain do that. What we see Cain doing is a self-focus. There is no brokenness to what he has done. There's just further self-focus and further resentment and rejection. All he does is complain. No, I'm sorry for killing my brother. No repentance, just complaint. And then the Lord says this. The Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. That word Nod means wandering. He settled in the land of wandering to wander. And it's even further east from what Adam and Eve were sent to. So it's going further away from God's presence. And notice the difference We know that when Adam and Eve were were banished from the garden, 
They didn't want to. They were forcibly dragged out with Cain. He's offering. He's like, I'm out of here. I, I, I will go out of your presence, Lord. Again, hard-hearted. Why does God put a mark on Cain? Doesn't it seem like it would have been fitting to just be like, hey, you know what? Like, you are so hard-hearted You don't care about anyone but yourself. So, you know what? You had your way with your brother. Why not let other people have their way with you? But again, God does not do that. Instead, he puts a mark on him. And it would testify that this man should be dead. But the Lord will not allow it. And what the Lord says, what he declares will stand. He stays alive. Even in his unrepentant state, God preserves him. We don't know if he does because Cain would come to repentance at a later time, but he is merciful to leave him alive. And even in this moment, we see Cain harbors more anger. He feeds it and he tells himself that He's not his brother's keeper, right? But what does Jesus say? Jesus says that we are to love the Lord our God with every fiber of our being, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So then when he's actually questioned about that, well, who's my neighbor? Trying Again, somebody who's just trying to find the line, like, what's the least amount that I have to do? Jesus responds with the story of the Good Samaritan, which illustrates this kingdom reality that we are to have favoritism for everyone but ourselves. It's literally that we would count others better than ourselves. That's the kingdom reality. So yeah, actually, you are, I am our brother's keeper. We need to be more concerned or as concerned about others' well-being rather than just our own. Again, Cain was so self-focused. Satan, the world, and everything inside of us will tell us the opposite. We think about number one, and who's number one? It's us, right? Isn't this exactly what Satan wants? Isn't that exactly what the world would teach us? You need to look out for yourself. Isn't that exactly what our own hearts would be drawn towards? But Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The message is deny yourself. That's the message. Discipleship, following Jesus, is extreme. And that seemingly harsh language of denying yourself, taking up your cross, is intended to make this clear. There is no halfway measure in following Christ. It's all or it is nothing. By definition, it's not a hobby, but total and complete allegiance to him in every corner of our heart. Who is your primary allegiance? Is it Jesus or is it yourself? Christ calls us to exclusive allegiance and complete submission to him. And as we submit and give full allegiance to him, the Holy Spirit does this work. It starts to begin to make us into the image of God that we were created to bear. We become more Christ-like. Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel, speaking back to Genesis 4, offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Isn't it interesting that in the New Testament, even though in this story we don't hear Abel say a word, in the New Testament it says that Abel is still speaking today. 
we see also in Hebrews 12, 24, it says, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What did the blood of Abel cry out? It cried out for justice. What does the blood of Jesus cry out? It cries out mercy. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. It cried out for mercy, and that's what the cross does for us. It speaks a better word. It's what we just sang about in so many of the songs we sang this morning. We learn some things about what it means to offer acceptable worship from this story. And I think it's good for us to reflect on how we ourselves can be guilty of offering worship that is just outwardly acceptable to God, while all the while thinking our own thoughts and having our own agendas. You know, how often do we do the outwardly righteous in order to earn approval from God or get attention from people? It can be even good things like reading God's word, like prayer. It can be good things like attending church or serving in church. Are we ultimately doing it for his glory or are we doing it for our own? Abel gave the first fruits not because he felt like he had to take what was his and give it to the Lord. No, he understood that everything he had was actually God's and that he was just a steward. He understood that even his own life wasn't his. This life is yours, God. And then he gave. It's that right understanding. It's that pure heart. Cain understood himself as master of his own domain. And true and right worship is when we understand that everything we have has been given to us from the Lord. Everything. Your ability to make money, your house, your family, your gifts, your work, all things were given to us. You haven't earned anything. Boy, that changes our perspective. So what do we learn about God in Genesis 4? God is gracious, and he stands ready to forgive. God is wise. He warns of the true nature of sin. He gives a heads up way before things are at a breaking point. We also see that God is just. He always punishes sin, and if he wouldn't, it would make God not God. But now for us as believers, our punishment is on Christ. Your forgiveness was not free. It cost Jesus his life. No sin goes unpunished. It's either on you or it's on Jesus. Not only that, but God is gracious in the midst of his justice. He's long-suffering. So as we close, before I pray and we sing, and then you leave and you go about your week, I want you to think of these things. In what way are you self-focused? In what ways are you thinking of yourself before others? Where are you just going through the motions for the Lord? Where are you what are you doing? What are you, what are you supposed to be doing, but your heart is far from him? I want you to answer the question that Cain dodged. Who is it that you're angry with? Who is it that you are telling yourself, I can just keep this low-level anger on the back burner and it will be fine? What baby or half-grown or full-grown tiger do you have in your closet? Where are you jealous or where are you bitter? What sin by the strength of the Holy Spirit needs to be killed? And will you turn that over to the Lord? Because the Lord is swift to come into the aid of those who confess.
who have a broken and contrite heart. He is ready with grace and mercy because the blood of Christ speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Let's pray. God, we confess that we need you and we'll never stop needing you. God, forgive us for the ways in which we just go through the motions. God, I pray that you would lead and guide us to repentance. God, convict us when we are just doing outward things when really we're not following you and our heart is not for you. God, forgive us for that. Father, I pray for every single person in this room, God, that there would be repentance in that and that we would turn, that you would make our heart passionate for you, that we wouldn't have the view that we have a relationship for what we can get out of it, but truly it's just because of you. You are more than enough. God, and I pray that there would be many here who are convicted of maybe sins that they've been harboring, where they would now uh, put it to action, that they would look for ways to kill it by your spirit and by your help. We are so grateful for your word and all that it teaches us. Thank you for Genesis. Thank you for all that you have done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.